Welcome all to how to make cerveza with Python. Here I have Chesco Iqual. Give him some claps. Well, thank you for being here. Welcome all. Uh, my name is Chesco Iqual. I am a backend developer at Elements Interactive. Uh, it's a company from the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about how to make a, how to brew beer with Python more or less. So uh, there are some things that I, I would like you to, to leave here, to leave this room with some ideas, and um, some of them are. I, I would like to know, you to know how to build an IoT backend. Which are the technologies, the protocols, and the tools that are out there? And I will do some comparative so you get to know what's out there and also which is the one that may fit you best if you have to do a project like this. Uh, some backend considerations that people will not tell you about, but you as a backend developer, you need to make sure that uh, they are taken into account. Uh, you will need a full running architecture for an IoT backend. And of course, you will learn how to brew beer. Actually, you're not, sorry. If you want to leave the room, you can skip 30 minutes. So first I want to talk to you about Minibrew, which is uh, the project for which we developed uh, this platform. Minibrew is an amazing machine. Uh, you can actually brew beer with it, and you, it will guide you since uh, getting to know new recipes through a mobile app. Uh, and then you can choose the recipe you want to brew. It will be sent to your home, and then you will you will just pour the ingredients into it, and, and the machine will take uh, care to do everything from the first until the last pr part of the process. And it will also teach you how to, how to brew beer, even if you have no idea at all. So at the end, you will start being, uh, having no knowledge about it, and after several brews, you will be a total expert. This machine comes with a mobile app. The mobile app uh, is going to show real-time data of what the machine is doing at, at this moment. It's going to show um, what is the current temperature of the ingredients that are inside the machine, what is the current step, what, uh, what is the target temperature in case you're in a very cold place, a very warm place, and it takes longer to get to that temperature, et cetera, et cetera. It will also help you uh, to see if there is any error in your machine. For instance, it loses connectivity, anything like this. It will also tell you. And um, uh, it will also uh, allow you to start and stop uh, brewing sessions, so you will actually only interact with the machine through the mobile app. So this is not everything that the project has, of course, because otherwise I wouldn't be here giving a talk. Uh, actually, there is Python in the middle, yes. So, well, not only Python, also some others. So um, I will focus the presentation on actually explaining to you what you have to put in the middle of those two things for it to work seamlessly. So let's get technical. First, I want to share the project requirements that probably when you get a customer or you want to build something like, like this, you will, you will have. You will need to, we will need to deliver real-time data. We want to have from the mobile phone, we want to know exactly what the machine is doing in real time on, or real time, that's fine as well, but quite close. We will need to have security uh, in the communications, we're all actually sending sensitive information because the recipes sometimes will be copyrighted and uh, we cannot, we cannot uh, let anyone see it. Uh, we will need obfuscation uh, because in case somehow the, the channel got compromised, nobody would be able to see what actually is going through the, through the channel. Authentication, if we get somebody knocking at, the, at our API or our, our platform saying it's a device, is it actually a device? And if one device gets compromised, can we disable it? Two-way communications, of course, because we not only get real-time data from the mini-brews, but we will also send actions to the mini-brews. So we need both, both ways communication. Resiliency, the system has to be resistant, and if, in case it falls, it needs to go back fast, because people expect responsiveness in there in their devices. And also, it, it has to be lightweight. Uh, in the IoT, usually we got, and this is the case as well, we got really constrained environments, and this makes us have to mind every kilobyte that we use in our, in our project, especially in the, in the device. Also, we have to take into account that the, 
the packages that we send, information that we send, the bigger it is, the slower it will be. So that's also two considerations on lightweight that we have to take into account. And some other project requirements that we may get is the last known status. What happens if a machine suddenly goes offline? We need to know what, was it, what it was doing right before. That will help us debug it. The bagging of the machine, of course, for the production, uh, the production personnel, staff, they need to be able to take a mini brew that is not in correct state and be able to debug it, send uh, different channels of communication only for debugging purposes. We will need a, an admin site also for uh, being able to set up uh, the users, the mini brews, their keys, everything. A mobile app API, I don't need to explain that if there is a, an app. Uh, rainbows, etc. By this, I mean that this is a project that is going on, is growing. So we have to take into consideration that we may get new requirements that we didn't get at the moment that we were delivered the first round of requirements. Actually, this is usually in every project, right? But in this case, as being a, a startup, it's more likely that this will happen. Then, the other thing that I mentioned before, as a backend developer, you need to take into consideration some things that not always will come as requirements. For instance, you need to take into account scalability, which is a word that is overused. It's in every job offering. It's in every, every company that has scalability. Every project is scalable. But actually, in IoT, on this project, we have to take it into account when building the architecture. Proven technologies. By this, uh, I mean that we cannot use a technology that is kicking right now and in one or two years is going to be obsolete. We cannot afford that. Small tech stack. This is important for several reasons. It's going to be easier to maintain for the people that goes after us. It's going to have less errors. Uh, the the um, connection tests are going to be easier. We're going to have a much easier life. And error tracking. If there is something going wrong, we want to be able to debug it. This is the usual that we do in Python, but before entering a project, you have to take it into account. Reduce the data transfer. Uh, as I mentioned before, reducing data transfer will do two things. Uh, one, uh, make faster messages, and the other will make uh, cheaper bills in, in our cloud uh, provider. And documentation, the most important one, because we all love documentation and we all love to write documentation, so this is something that we have to take into account. Actually, nobody writes documentation. So this is the phase that you may, you may do when you see this list of requirements and you never tackle the project like this. So it, let's go, let's do something and let's go step by step. Let's go step by step and let's start with the communications protocol. This is, this is a requirement that this is a decision that depending on how we make it now, it will affect the possibilities that we have later to, to, for technologies or software. So we're going to analyze very fast the, the protocols that are out there. Uh, there are some of them that are already out of scope, like we are not even considering them because of uh, throughput. But I will mention them that because you could, you could probably build uh, IoT like this, like HTTP, XMPP, DDS, AMQP. MQP is good for servers, but, but not so much for IoT. Then we got MQTT. MQTT is one of the big players in the, in the protocols for, communi for communicating with IoT. Uh, it was developed by IBM and then given to the Eclipse Foundation for, uh, as, as, open, as open source. Um, MQTT is especially tailored for constrained, uh, for constrained environments and has some good things from AMQP, for instance, has quality of service where you can decide if you want to, to deliver what the message one and I don't care what happens, or you want to deliver message one and only one, so you have a range of qualities be between that. That's a very nice feature. It also allows routing for, uh, based on, topic, on topics, which allows uh, for spreading messages through several receivers. So this is, this is good. There's another one. Uh, there's COAP. COAP was developed by the Constraint Resources Group at IETF, and it's also one of the big players in, in IoT protocol uh, for, yeah, for IoT, obviously. So um, COAP is slightly different. It uses more client-server configuration and uses HTTP verbs, even though it's not HTTP, so it doesn't have its disadvantages. 
both are targeted for co very constrained environments, but uh, even though they are very similar in that, they are very different in some other things. So for instance, they are very different in the way that MQTT uses a broker in the middle and everyone connects to it as a client. So then you can do PubSub and all, all of this kind of stuff. And COEP uses a client server both ways. So then that's a, a big difference already. Another thing is that MQTT uses long-lived TCP connections while COEP uses UDP. So this is already another big difference. Uh, for these reasons, actually probably you could do with both, but for these reasons we, we chose MQTT. So now that we have our protocol, it's time to, to look for a solution. So out there you, you will find a lot of, of already uh, like companies that they claim that they have a backend ready for IoT so you don't have to program anything, and that's kind of true, more or less. So uh, we're going to analyze one, because there's not time for, for analyzing more. I want to analyze one of them, one of these comprehensive backend solutions, and see if it fits our, our requirements. So I'm going to, to analyze AWS IoT from Amazon and see if it's actually a good, uh, a good choice for our, for our case. I'm going to go very, very fast through the, through the, through the architecture because uh, Amazon declined to sponsor my talk, so I will go very, very fast. So there's some things that we like from, from Amazon. For instance, authentication, authorization, registry. This is one of the requirements that we had. We needed to authenticate the, the device, the machines one by one individually in case one was compromised. Amazon provides that. MQTT, of course. Here's the broker. Device shadows. This was also a requirement for us. We needed to know the last known status. Here it is, provided out of the box. And an API. Also, we needed an API for our apps. Here it is, out of the box as well. The small disadvantage, the small disadvantage being picky, is that uh, you're, going to, you're going to have to use a very generic API, and maybe it wouldn't be as uh, reduced as if you would do the API yourself for only your purposes. But anyway, it's documented, if, because you were all wondering that probably, and, and it's out of the box ready for us. Some things we don't like, uh, the SDK, well, this is a really small thing, but the SDK used uh, a couple hundred kilobytes, and that was actually too much for our constraint device. Uh, so we couldn't really use the SDK. Actually, yeah. So in, probably in another project, this wouldn't be a problem, uh, but in our case, it was. Then there is the rules engine. Amazon, this is not a problem in itself. This is good, but... It's good if you're using other Amazon products. Amazon makes it really, really easy to connect things between Amazon. You can send information, set rules, notifications, everything, queues. But only if you're inside Amazon, then if you're out, you need to do quite more work to connect it to your external uh, part of the platform. And another thing that we didn't like too much is that the applications have to connect using an API. And an API would, doesn't sound really to real time, right? Uh, having to do an HTTPS call every time that we need to to get the latest tick of information doesn't doesn't sound too good as well. So let's analyze the project requirements as we had them. Let's analyze what Amazon is 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 achieving already out of the box. So we got security; it's a secure channel. We got authentication. We got two-way communication. We got good resiliency. Amazon claims they are very good at that, and I think they are. We got the last known status, we got an API, we got a lot of scalability, as much as your wallet can afford. We have proven technologies, well, uh, proven technologies, Amazon has not been out there for long enough to be called a proven technology, but, I mean IoT, but uh, there's a full team working on it, so we can be quite sure that it's not, the support is not going to be dropped in one year or two years. So we, that's why we tick the proven technology, because if they have bugs, they'll fix them. At least we expect. And documentation, most important. So some things that Amazon doesn't provide us, it did, it, we're not happy with the way that they, they were giving us the option of real-time data. Uh, we don't have obfuscation because the data that we're sending is JSON. That's the format that is used. Uh, lightweight for the small reason that I commented before, that we couldn't put the SDK into our device, but actually because we're using JSON, so we're actually sending more data than we should. I'll go to that later. Rainbows, etc. I didn't mark it. Well, actually, I marked it red 
because uh, it will be hard for us to implement new requirements if, if they do not fit nice into Amazon, because then we'll have to do them ourselves. Outside, small tech stack. There are some things that we will not be able to do in that stack, like admin side, debugging, uh, all of that. So what happened? That we, at the end, we will have to have our own admin side, our own stack of technologies for having that running. And then we will end up having two big pieces of software, the one that is related to Amazon and the other one. So that this, this is why it's, it cannot be considered like a really small stack. And then the reduced data transfer, if everything has to go through the server one and the other we're using uh, JSON for this, it's not going to be considered like a reduced data transfer. So the conclusion for this is that you can use it, but only if it really matches what you want to do. Otherwise, let's check how to set up our own solution. So first thing is to get a broker. So we need to get a broker that supports MQTT, and we have like a lot of options, a lot of them. Uh, there is every week or two weeks, probably there pops a new company that has an MQTT server. So I'm just going to show a few ones, ActiveMQ, Mosquito, M EMQTT, VernMQ, HiveMQ, CloudMQ, RabbitMQ. So uh, there's not a lot of creativity in the names for these kind of companies. But, uh, I mean, you could choose any that you wanted. Some are uh, pay, you, you pay them and they are already uh, deployed. The others, you deploy them yourself. But we chose RabbitMQ for going very fast for some reasons. We, it's been a top player for many years. It has scalability proven, both vertical, of course, and, and horizontal. It can convert from MQTT to other protocols, which is a goodie. It's not something that we require, but AMQP is something that, that servers like. There is no payment for use, and we were familiar with it, so this also counted. So that's what we chose this, but probably if you chose any of the others, it would be good as well. Now, we get an extra bonus for doing the, the broker ourselves, and is that now we can do PoopSub, and uh, the Minibrew can send the information to RabbitMQ, and the devices, all of them that they want to listen to that actual brewing session, they can be listening to, to, to Rabbit. So what the information for real time doesn't need to pass through the server anymore. So what is, what is Python doing while the devices get real time data? Chillaxing. There's no need to do anything. Now what? Let's talk to that broker. We got a broker, right? So we'll use Python now, finally. There is a library from Eclipse. From, and I promised myself I wouldn't show any code because this talk is beginner and also it's, it's very short in time. But now that I already showed it, let me go very fast through it. So uh, it's so easy as you only need to import the MQTT module and then you just set a few callbacks on connection, subscribe to a topic on this connection, on message, do something with the message. You connect to the broker and, and voila, you get it. That it's so easy to get a, an MQTT server in Python. So we got one thing fixed. Time to look at the API. In Python, of course. So options. Here, I could go through all of the options. And actually, uh, there would be a lot of fights if we started a discussion. Uh, only discussing this slide could take like a full talk. And only discussing each one of them would take a full talk as well, each one of them. So I'm going to just go very fast and say which one we chose, OK? So bottle. Tasty, Django Tasty Pie, Flask, Falcon, Django REST Framework, uh, and there are even more. Actually, we chose Django REST Framework because we, of course, we were familiar with it. We already had a part of the API with that. Uh, and, and, well, it's scalable. There is loads of documentations of ex external plugins and apps, and there's everything you may need. It, you can cache everything. So it's a really good. And now with the latest version that I just got to know a few, a few days ago, uh, there's really good, uh, there are some goodies like automatic documentation and stuff that you should really check out. So that's it. Oh, sorry. OK, so uh, how are we doing right now after the choices? We got real-time data now. We got security, because through broker you can also connect to SSL. Two-way communication, thanks to MQTT. And we reduce the data transfer by skipping the going through the API. So things we also got is the last known status because we, because we program it. Now it's our API. 
we got the bugging, we can use the bugging and we can use the admin side to help the, the staff debug the machines. We got the admin side with Django, of course. And we got the, the API we mentioned. We also got error tracking because we are familiar with tracking errors with Python. So that can be considered that it will be easier for us to debug Python than to debug any other stuff. So some other things we already got by using those, those two is resiliency and scalability, but this depends, of course, on how you do your DevOps, how you're going to deploy, if you're going to deploy in clusters, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's full of documentation of how to make these systems scalable because they are very famous technologies. We got rainbows, et cetera. <coughs> Sorry. We got rainbows, et cetera, because um, now it's Python and we can do everything we want with it. That's, we all know that, right? And proven technologies, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be in this conference. Small tech stack. Now we got only these two pieces of software and that we really understand. And some things that we still don't have. We don't have obfuscation. The messages are still being sent through JSON. We don't have authentication. The, everyone can connect to the broker and just start messing, messing up there. And we cannot say it's lightweight on the device because we uh, just sending messages to MQTT that's super light. We don't need any library for that. And, and it's also, but it's not lightweight that we're not sending the small amount of information. We're actually sending more information than needed. And documentation, it's fine, guys. It's full of documentation for these two things. So let's start solving the remaining parts. Authentication in Python as well. This, there is a really nice plugin for RabbitMQ. It may sound a little bit tricky. Let me explain it. It's a RabbitMQ authentication backend via HTTP. Okay, what does this mean? Now, when the device, uh, when the machine wants to connect to the broker, instead of the broker just saying, yeah, you can connect or you cannot connect, it will pass that information to Python and Python will check the database and say if that, that machine can actually connect or not. So then we don't need to have all that in the broker. It can be in our normal database. Nice. And response, and remember, it's a long-lived TCP connection, just once. That's really cool. This works for devices as well. So we checked another one. There's authentication now. So let's go for the last one. Obfuscated and lightweight messages. So how are we going to do this? With Python? No, with Google. So. If you don't know protocol buffers yet, you should, if you use any kind of API. Uh, it's a protocol from Google that actually, well, uh, this could take also another talk just to explain, but I will try to, to just go very fast and, and explain it. But as you see in this example, Jason, that the device could send to, to the server or, or, or to the machine could send to the server or the device, you see there, in each one of these messages, there's going to be a lot of repeated information. You're going to send the ID every time, the ID string. You're going to send the timestamp by string. You're going to send the data, action, sensor one, sensor two. This is information that is going to be repeated over and over and over. And that's going to consume data. And that is also going to make it slower. So we don't want that. That's also, it's really easy to read. How are we going to solve this with protocol buffers? Protocol buffers, actually, what, what, what it does is that this specification of how the message is built is shared between the parties that are communicating, but it's not transmitted through the wire. So actually, you got the specification on both ends, and you only send the data that is different every time. If anybody from Google was here, probably they would shoot me, because it, it's not really like this. But this is an example, so, so you see actually what is being transferred, yeah? This, Google also didn't want to sponsor my talk. I don't know why, but, so I'm not going to show you how it works, but uh, this is uh, really easy, you know, just build which fields your message will have if they are required, optional, so then you can change the requirements. They are always backwards compatible, and then you will not have problem uh, if you're upgrading the message that you sent and somebody's using an old spec. So how are we doing now? Of course, both things checked. We are happy with the solution now. This is a very, very small final architecture. Very, very simple. But uh, you can see that we, we got the web servers. 
We got the, the three blocks that we talked about, uh, some endpoints for RabbitMQ, an MQTT listener and responder. And then we got the, the Django API um, for, the, for the devices. And we also got the Rabbit broker for, for devices and machines, for the web servers, for, to communicate. Uh, and of course, database, cache, cache and, and everything that is usually used in a, in a, web, in a web platform. So the, everything is scalable because everything is in the cloud. So and everything, all of the, those technologies are easy to scale. So this is it. Uh, the, this is already it. I was uh, probably my boss is going to watch me on YouTube. So I uh, I want to tell you that I work work at a really cool company called Elements Interactive. Uh, <laughs> we work at. Uh, Barcelona in Spain and Almere in the Netherlands. So if you want to do cool projects like this, uh, be sure to enter and, or just contact me after the talk and I'll be happy to, to explain what we do and how we do it. So thank you very much for your attention. You got any questions? Uh, what about unit testing? I hope you write. Sorry? Uh, what about unit testing? Yeah. I hope you write them, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We got them, we got them. Uh, <laughs> actually, and documentation. The question, the question is, uh, which uh, test runner are you using? We are only using the, the default one, I mean. Okay. Yeah. Is it PyTest or NOS test? Or right now, we're using the test cases, but... Uh, we were thinking of trying PyTest, but we still didn't do it. So right now we got a very, very good coverage, but on, on test cases, normal. How does the beer taste like? <laughs> uh, hi, I have one question. Do you have a hardware embedded security? Because I wonder what if someone hacks the API and make like um, and increase the temperature and pressure and make like a remote bomb, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> or set the mini brew on fire, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, the mini brewery is also intelligent, and and it does a validation of all the recipes, and so there is no there is no way that anything that could break the mini brew is accepted. Uh, actually, if you send a recipe to the mini brew and it finds it, it's not good. Uh, it will just answer that the, it could not be started, with some information, of course. But but yeah, there's no no risk for bombs. So if you want to buy it, it's it's safe. Any more? Wow. Uh, have you thought about using Thrift instead of Google Protocol Buffers? If yes, then uh, what's better about Protocol Buffers? I have, you know, I don't know. Protocol Buffers better than, sorry? Uh, Thrift, Apache Thrift. I haven't, I don't know about it. Okay. We were pretty happy with Protocol Buffers we, because they had everything we needed. The, the the benchmarks were, were very good. So actually, we just found it. This is really cool. Stop here. So actually, we didn't try that. OK. But I'll, I'll write it down. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what kind of data do you send from the mini brew to Ooh, the app? It's, it's uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm I don't really know exactly because that's more of a hardware thing, but there is like a zillion sensors around all the mini brew pressure, uh, the, the, if there is water flowing around, which is the current status, if there is action spending from the user, what is the next thing that it's going to do? I mean, there's a lot of information. Actually, the, the JSON I just showed, it was like a ridiculous example because it's actually much bigger. So, so yeah, that's... Have you tested what the scalability limit of your stack is? Have you tried to topple the thing? No, not yet. Not the top. We're actually working with Minibrew sending, uh, like, if I don't remember wrong, it's sending it's Minibrew that we're testing. There are uh, quite some of them, uh, quite some PCBs testing at the same time. And each one is sending like 60 times more information that it will send in, in the real world because we're really, really logging everything into uh, very uh, detailed. So right now we can handle already with a really small 
uh, cloud architecture, and I, and I mean really small, uh, we can handle like hundreds of mini brews already. So I, I, when we go to, when we just make a normal uh, uh, production deployment, it's going to be able to, to handle uh, thousands, and of course, we will, we're going to implement the scalability, clustering, and everything. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Jessica.